This interview is being conducted on February the 21st in the year 2006 in the uh, home of Mr. Hyman Ray uh, here in Niles, uh, Illinois. Uh, my name is, is Neil O'Shea and I'm speaking with Mr. Hyman Ray. Uh, Mr. Ray was born on October the 23rd, uh, 1913 and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project and here is his story. Mr. Ray, when did you uh, enter the service during the time of World War II? When war was declared. I, I wanted to enter the service right away. I could have received a deferment because in our business we were manufacturing gloves and we manufactured Marine Corps gloves for the Marine Corps. But I told my dad, I, I want to go in. Wow. I feel that I, it's my duty. So I wrote a letter to the Navy Department in Washington to ask him to apply for, to enter the School of Naval Intelligence because my background, is, I have a legal background, a licensed attorney. But the letter I received, and this is the letter I received from them, back to open up. Here we go. January 14th, 1942. We have been advised that you will be unable to secure a waiver on your physical deficiency, referring to my eyesight. In view of this, we will be unable to give further consideration to your application for a commission in the intelligence branch of the Naval Reserves. We regret that this action is necessary and wish to assure you of our appreciation for your interest in the Navy and in Naval activities. Signed by Lieutenant Commander, Naval District Intelligence Officer, 9th Naval District. I always kept that letter. And I said, when I got that letter, I said, okay, I tried on this, you don't want me, come and get me. And they did. And this is in, this is in January. They got me in uh, April, April of 1942. That's when I was drafted as 1A. But private, previously to that, I traveled through the South by myself. I had a convertible car. And I went to visit a friend of mine, a, a distant relative, who was a colonel in the medical corps at uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana. And I went to see him and he tried to get me to enlist down there. But they wouldn't take me because I'd been, I was referred as 1A up here. So I said, okay, then I'm going home and I'll wait. And when I got home, I, I noticed after that, I could have had a deferment. But I decided I'm going in. My dad said, if that's the way you feel, then go ahead. So I en enlisted, or I was drafted in April of 1942. So the, the eyesight uh, deficiency that prevented your working in naval intelligence, right. it wasn't serious enough to prevent you from being classified as 1A. No, no, still 1A. But they took me in, I mean, I'll skip a lot and tell you that they put me in radio school. And I was up to 15 words a minute. And then they called me in and told me, you can't go any further. I said, why not? He says, because of your eyesight, you can't fly. So after so many weeks of radio school, I was out. Went back to doing nothing. And I finally, in fact, a couple of times, I was even wheeling a shovel outside, trying to do something to keep busy, because I was going crazy. Then I heard it, that the somebody in the main office had been transferred, and there was an opening. So I was brash enough to go ahead, went to the main office, and I said, I understand you're looking for somebody to work in the administration. 
and they asked me who I am and my background, and I told them. They said, it sounds good. Would you like to work here? Can you type? Well, I couldn't tell them I, I don't finger type. I mean, I type with two fingers, that's all. I said, sure, I can type. Like anybody else, I just embellished a little. They took me, and that's when I start. I started out as a private. I went all the way through, and then go through the years, I advanced to sergeantcy, first corporal, first PFC, then corporal, then sergeant, and then staff sergeant. And that's, I was stationed at that time in Belleville, Illinois, at Scott Field. Now there was friends of the family who we used to do business with, lived in St. Louis. So I went to visit them and I got to know them very well on weekends when I had a pass. And one day I went to visit them and they're sitting and talking to him. And all of a sudden a, a staff car pulls up outside his house and an officer gets out. And I see an officer and here I'm sitting with my shirt open. I'm in uniform and bedraggled and everything. And I said, wait a minute, I'm gonna get cleaned up. He said, no, leave me just the way you are. So he comes in and my friend introduced me to the Colonel. They go, they went in the kitchen and talked. Then they come back about 15 minutes later and the Colonel says to me, what are you doing over at Scott Field? I said, practically nothing. I said, it's a little administrative work, but uh, it's pretty tiresome. He said, how would you come to like to work for me? I says, Colonel, I said, I don't know who you are. What do you do? He says, I am in charge of the G4 section of the Central Tech Training Command. That means it governs all the schools in the Midwest here, all their contracts and everything. And with your legal background, you'd fill in beautifully. So I looked at him and I said, look, off the record, can we speak? He says, sure. I said, man to man, what's in it for me? I said, I'll be very brash about it, but I'd like to know what I'm getting into. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to be a master sergeant. Here, I'm only a staff sergeant. That's two more grades up, and they're difficult grades. He said, I'll tell you what. He says, you earn it, you'll get it. And I looked at him, and I said, okay, I'll take your word on that. I'll go. I came back to Scott Field. The next day, I was called in by my commanding officer. You're being transferred. They sent a staff car from headquarters in St. Louis to pick me up and take me to St. Louis. Oh. So I, be, I entered their office over there and worked for this lieutenant colonel as one of the clerks in his office. Well, I progressed all the way through and more and more, took over more and more contract work for him and a lot of investigating work. And he kept his word and by January of 44, that's uh, almost two years later, then I came went in, I became a master sergeant. And I got pictures of the, of the master sergeantcy. And uh, I was there until war was declared. I mean, war was over in Japan. On that day, I got my orders to ship. And I, my order that to overseas. Now I told them I said I've got enough points not to go. They said not according to us you're going. So, okay. Halfway across the ocean, on the way to the Philippines, they called me in and said you were right. You had enough points. You didn't have to go. <laughs> I said yeah, but I'm in the ocean. You're not going to turn the ship around. They laughed and they said nope. You're going to the Philippines. So I got to the Philippines. <coughs> And there, they're looking around for somebody, for something for me to do, because they had nothing my, that I would qualify for. Well, I was overqualified for what they had. But finally, the orders came through to send me to, to uh, Tokyo. When I got to Tokyo, I was called in for reclassification. And when I talked to the 
officer there. He looked at my record and he says, <coughs> oh, he says, you're a licensed attorney. I said, that's right. He said, how would you like to work for the judge advocate? I said, wait a minute, I don't like army law from what I've heard. What happens to enlisted people? He laughed, he said, no. He says, you're hearing a lot of things. He said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gossip, but it isn't that at all. So I said, well, I don't know. Yeah, I'll tell you what, he says, take the job for a month. If you don't like it, I'll transfer you out. I said, well, I'm happy because I have nothing to lose. So I took the job for a month and I wound up six months. And after six months, my time was up and they sent me home. But that's what happened to me on my service fighting. So I, I went through all the grades from plain private to master sergeant, which is the top enlisted grade rank. And uh, I felt fine. I was treated royally by officers. I only had trouble with one officer. And, uh, was that for any particular reason? This officer, this was happened at the headquarters in St. Louis. My job at that time was to compile a report, compiling the records from ordinance, from the uh, personnel, from the three things. I forgot the other one. And then our section, I was in maintenance section, G4. And I had a lot of trouble with one officer in one of those sections, I forgot which, that he was just brushing me off because he's an officer and I was an enlisted man. And he wasn't listening. I tell him, I got to have it to complete my report for the colonel. He thought I was, you know, it just brushed me off. And I came back and I was burning. And I sat down on my desk and my, at that time I was working close with a major who sat next to me. And he said to me, he said, you don't look good, what happened? I said, oh, I think I had a run in with an officer. I don't know what's gonna happen because I opened my mouth. He said, who was it? And I told him, he said, what'd you do? And I told him the story of what happened, the way I was treated and I just couldn't take it anymore, and I just blew my top. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, in walks that officer. And he comes over to our desk, and I'm here, my major sitting here, and this officer is standing right in front of us. And he looks at the major and he says, Major, how do you like working with that cocky sergeant of yours? Just the words he used, I never, never forgot it. The major looked at him. And he looked at him, can I say things I'm not supposed to? Sure. He says, look, you son of a bitch. He says, you ever treat my enlisted person like that again, and I'll have your stripes. I'll have your commission taken away from you. Beautiful. Now get the hell out of this office. And he turned around and got out. And this major is from the South. And I heard stories about the Southerner, the red, what they call him a redneck, how the, his, his Back when it gets turned red, that's actually what happened. I never forgot it. And from then on, I had no trouble. That's the only time I ever had trouble with an officer. And he was he was a redneck, the the officer that you had trouble with? No. He wasn't. Your, no. Your, Just, your defender was uh my defender was a redneck. Was a redneck. But but he was but he came up from the through the service. From playing from regular enlisted man to major. So he'd been in the service quite a while. In fact, for many, many years, even after he died after the service, his wife used to send me a Christmas card. And I was shipped. I mean, at that time, that's when I was sent overseas. It called in, it, they, had, they came out with a, a ruling, no enlisted personnel to work in headquarters, only officers. So they brought in a lieutenant colonel to take my place. Wow. So yeah. what happened then is that I went overseas and went to Japan and wound up, like I told you, in the judge advocate's office, became chief clerk over there. And uh, that colonel, for many years after the service, sent me a card every Christmas. Wanted to know how I was, how I was getting along. 
So in Japan, were you involved in any of the uh, war crime uh, preparation or? <clears throat> Only with, with charges against personnel. I mean, some of them are charged with desertion. Some of them are charged with, uh, well, Celia something, uh, something like that. But uh, nothing, nothing with the criminal, with the Japanese prisoners. But we were sent, we weren't sent. We, were, we lived in a camp called Iramagawa outside of Tokyo. Iramagawa, outside of Tokyo. And one of the fellows in our, in our barracks happened to be a chauffeur for the general. So on weekends, when the general wasn't doing anything, he allowed the current, this sergeant to take the car and us fellows, and we drive through Japan to see what Japan looked like. He took us and showed us to Lake Hakuni. There's a lake where they interred all four nationals during the war. And I have pictures of that, of that place. And uh, we, we had one heck of a time because most of the boys in there were college graduates. And we used to have arguments on all subjects, religion, status, the way we're being treated, well, how we should treat people. And, and it was an experience I never, I'll never forget. How did you find the, the Japanese people or the Japanese culture or? No problem at all. No problem. No problem at all. All you had to do is, if you had chewing gum or you had American I had articles, you were king. I mean, some of the boys, even, you know, that's where they picked up women. But by that time, I was just married before I went into service, before I was shipped. And I said to myself, uh -uh, I'm going home clean. I'm not touching anybody. Yeah. So I never, I never enjoyed it with, with them. So did you think that the Japanese people were ill-served by their government or their um, leaders that the, how? how I, it's a difficult question to answer because we had no contact with them. The only contact we ever had was on these little trips that we took with, this, with the general chauffeur, visiting these people. They treated us nicely. I mean, I brought home silk, I brought home a silk kimono for my wife that happened to be the engagement dress of a Japanese girl. It was a beautiful gown. I still have it here. And, uh, and some uh, yard goods silk. In fact, at one time, the colonel stopped at my desk and said, do you know where the silk mill is? I said, sure. He said, well, I'm gonna get a car this afternoon. He said, you come with me. I want to go and get some silk for my wife. And I looked at him because the order had just come out. We went over to the silk mill and the guy brings out this beautiful silk. And I said to him out of curiosity, I said, how much for this? And he tells me five packs of cigarettes. That's what he tells me, American cigarettes. And the colonel standing right there and we had just issued a directive against black marketing. The colonel looked at me and he says, I'll never forget, he says, I didn't hear a word, Sergeant. <laughs> That's what he told me. So I bought, I just had enough for that. And I was gonna get more. My wife had sent me a whole carton of cigarettes, but I never got them. Because I'm not kidding myself, I know what happened. When it came to Japan, the boys in the mail order, when they saw that, they kept it. We never saw it. So all told, you were in um, in Japan for. Um, I left. I left the states in September, and I came home in April. And you had a stop along the way in the Philippines. In the Philippines, yeah. Did so you did you Mid did Midway Island, and the Phil and Okinawa, and uh, I saw Manila. 
I got pictures of Manila and everything, the way it was bombed out. And it's, we were always amazed how, how pinpoint the bombing was. I mean, they could have a section like across the street completely bombed out and this side here wasn't touched. That's how accurate our bombers were. They did a job, no question. But they rebuilt everything. In fact, our office was the, I don't know what they call it, there was a name for it, where General MacArthur had his offices in that building. And we were supposed to move from the camp to that office the next day. And that's when I got my orders to go home. So I never did, I saw the office, but I never stayed in the office and worked there. Did you see MacArthur ever when you were there? Or? No. I never saw him. No, I just, see this, all I know, here's something that might be interesting to you. Hi, he's just uh, taken from his wallet this um, laminated card issued by the Army of the United States. Uh, it's an honorable discharge card that certifies uh, he is honorably discharged from the military service of the United States of America, and this certificate is awarded as testament of honest and faithful service to this country, and it's uh, given at the Separation Center at Camp Grant here in Illinois on the 3rd of February, 1946, signed by Major Chester Smith. And uh, on the card, it does indeed say that uh, Mr. Ray reached the level of Master Sergeant uh, with the headquarters squadron of the 5th Air Force. Yeah, he turned it over. And on the other side... It's my record. You know, I've never seen one of these before. I know, I yeah. know you haven't. Mm -hmm. I'm the only one that I know of all my friends who ever had one. All my decorations, which I have, I'd like to find out someday if I ever can get those replaced because they're gone somewhere. Did you want to read the medals that you received just into the record there that's nice on the mentions on the back there? Can you read? It's kind of small print. The print is very small, but it, it's amazing how much information they get on the back of the card. Let's see. Well, the order of a sharpshooter with a carbine, a marksman with a pistol, American Campaign Medal, Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal, Good Conduct Medal, World War II Victory Pin Medal, and one Service Strike. That's it. That's very impressive. So, um, what did you think? What did you, did did your uh, opinion of army law did it change uh, as a result of working in the only the only thing that changed was uh, I didn't like the fact that when enlisted personnel many times were brought before a court martial. There were no enlisted personnel on the board. They're all officers. Because I remember one time, one of these fellows was charged, I 
forgot what the charge was. But he had a civilian lawyer. And a civilian lawyer came to me at my desk one day and said, he wants me to get a copy of the whole record. He wants to take it back to the States with him. I said, uh-uh. He said, why not? So I said, you see the six stripes on my arm? I said, I got six stripes, I'm not gonna lose them. If I were to do all the records, army record, to you as a civilian, I said, I can be court martial. And I'm not gonna lose my record, my history with the service because you wanted this. I said, you can file for a re request it, but I'm not gonna do it myself. Mm -hmm. No way. So um, you had a, you had accumulated enough points to qualify for uh, not to go overseas. Not to go overseas. Yeah. And so, um, but and they later agreed with you. But you wound up serving another seven months overseas. Overseas, yeah. but you got to see Japan yeah. and the Army legal oh. side. Any re was it worth it? Or was oh you yeah. Oh yeah. It's the first time in my life I've ever been outside the states. And go to see the Philippines and see how they how they lived over there. And it's it was terrible. I mean, you see pictures now of what's going on, and I can picture in my mind a lot of that stuff that was happening then when it was being bombed out with no homes or anything. Or like in Japan itself. One one bad thing about Japan was, you know how they irrigated their fields? Human waste. Yeah, I've, I've heard that in certain yeah, they, places. We, we yeah. used to call them honey carts. So when you're driving, if we saw one ahead of you, you got ahead of them. You don't stay behind them. The smell would kill you. But that's what we used to call them, the honey carts. They would fertilize the rice fields or? And we're, we're all with human waste. Mm -hmm. That's where they fertilize in Japan. See, but land was very, very, well, uh, valuable, put it that way, because there wasn't a lot of it. That's why they they wanted to expand. They went to China first, and uh, thank God, I mean, that they hit the wrong people when they would hit the Americans. I mean, I remember I was in, in the Philippines and I saw where the Arizona was still, they, you know, was bombed out in Arbor, and it's still there now. They built a building over it, or a shelter over it, where people come and can see just what happened. Where hundreds of sailors were killed on that ship yeah. when it was bombed out. But uh, as an average, even when we traveled on their electric trains to go from one place to another, you know, we had a pass, a couple of GIs, we get on a train and ride. We want to see what's going on. And nobody bothered us. So we had no problem at all with that after the war. No resentment of the occupying if, or if the If there was an resentment, it wasn't, it wasn't against us. See, that's all I know. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, like I say, we, I traveled quite a bit through Japan, to Lake Hakuni, Yokohama, and Osaka, and all those different places, and we were treated well. All you had to do was have American money or or merchandise to trade with them. And you picked up some beautiful stuff. I mean, I've got, I have, the one, one thing I, I brought home, I'll bring it to you, I'll show you. <laughs> And uh, he says, are you free for a while? I said, why? He says, come on down here. I want to show you something. So I went down to the PX and he had a carton sitting on this table. And he said, I just got this in. He says, but I can't sell it here in the PX. It's too nice. I said, what is it? He said, I'll show you. He said, let me bring it in here. Come on, just move here. Just sit. Oops. From Japan to to uh, the islands, 
the main uh, main coast, like Taiwan, over then. At that time, it wasn't Taiwan, it was something else. I forgot the name. Anyway. Taipei or? I forgot what it was, but anyway, I told him, I'll tell you what, I said, I want you to bring my, bring, get a tea set for my wife of porcelain, you know, not, not porcelain, what do they call this? Like uh, Lenox, where, you know. Fine China? Or, yeah. 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 And I gave him the money, and he came back and he brought this beautiful set. And we packed it up and we shipped it home. I still have it here. My wife has it. I brought that home from there. So, hi, it's, um, maybe if we could just go back a little bit. It's, sure. uh, you already trained, qualified as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Had you grown up in, in Chicago? Oh, yeah, born and raised here. Born and raised in Chicago. You went to high school at... Uh, high school, Roosevelt High School. Oh, the Rough Riders. When yeah. they first opened. We were the, I was in the first freshman class at Roosevelt High School. And then you went to... And from there, I went to... We couldn't... That's when the Depression started. And I went to Crane College. For the first two years, it was free. And after two years, it, we, my folks were off a little better. We could afford it. I wound up two years at Northwestern University in Evanston. And when I finished there, then I went to Northwestern Law School for three years. And I came out and practiced law for a little over a year. And Uncle Sam came and took me. I was 31 years old. What um, what branch of law did you practice? Uh, probate. Probate, wills and states. I was, in, I was in probate at that time. I worked as a, a assistant to a cousin of mine who was an attorney here in Chicago who had an established practice. And uh, on my own, I did a couple of probate, some probate work. Didn't get much done because it ha everything happened too fast. The army came, and that's when I could have been deferred because of my our family business. I said, I'm going in. So when you um, were mustered out at your separation date, um, released from Camp Grant, um, did you want to go back into law then or go back into the family business? Went back into the family business because I was married while I was in the service. So, as a matter of fact, our first anniversary, I was overseas. Wow. See, and uh, I have pictures here showing you cards that were hand hand drawn by one of the, one of the GIs who was an artist who sent who made up a card so I could send it home to my wife on our first anniversary. And. Uh, I went back into the business because uh, uh, at that time we were extensively into military work. And the last contract we had, I remember, was 150,000 pairs for the Marine Corps to be shipped to San Francisco. And we had a wonderful reputation because out of 150,000 pairs, we had six pairs rejected. I mean, they were tough. They used to count the stitches per inch on a glove. Where was the plant or the factory? In Chicago. In, in Chicago. Oh yeah, it was all in Chicago. A particular company or what was the name of the company, may I ask? Oh, at that time, it was Ray Brothers Glove Company. My father and his brother, the two families, they had that. But while I was in the service, it, it broke up. And when I came out of the service, I went back with my father. We opened another plant on Montrose Avenue. The original one was around Ashland Avenue in Chicago. We had close to 200 people working at that time. And we, we took contracts and we opened up the place on, and, uh, on Montrose Avenue. 
but we stayed there 48 years. And my, my parents had passed away. My wife and I were running the business and we decided, got to give up manufacturing. We can't compete anymore with the imports. They're killing us. Because if we had government contracts and we were losing that too, we could meet the prices that the American manufacturers in the Philippines and in Puerto Rico, we, but we couldn't, we could compete with raw material prices, but not with labor. We had to give it up and we decided, my wife and I decided, instead of batting our heads against the wall, let them do the manufacturing and we'll wholesale and buy from them. And that's what we did. So we stayed in business till 19, let's see, from 46 to 80, no, 48 years. That'd be, what, 70, 80, 80, 1980s, 84, I think. Retired from the business in 1984. Yeah, we just closed the doors because our children, neither one, none. I had two daughters and neither husband was interested in that. One was a, one son-in-law was a lawyer and the other son-in-law was in the retail uh, men's clothing business. And they're not interested in manufacturing. Did you, had, had you ever thought that you might pursue a career in law instead of the, the family business? In or? the beginning, I in thought In the beginning. So. Yeah, until Uncle Sam took me away. And then when you came back, you just, I'm just going to go with the family business. It's a lot, makes yes. more sense. I have a well, I, could I, see, I could see what was happening with my dad. He's, he's getting older and it's one of those family deals. I mean, off the record on this. So Raymond, right, you were married in 1944. 1944. Was that a lady you'd known for a long time? No. No, I met her. I came home on a pass when I was in service in April. He was getting married. This friend of mine was getting married. And he says, I want you to come over to my girlfriend's house and uh, meet her. So <laughs> I can just picture it. Walking in the front door there's a young girl standing there. She's ringing the doorbell. And I'm ringing, I turn to the ring, I ring the same one. And she, I didn't know who she was. And we went up together and it turned out that we went to the same apartment. It was my boyfriend's wife's good girl, good friend. And he wanted me to meet this new girl. And that's the way I met her. It was on Friday the 13th on a blind date. Wow. I'll never forget. It was a lucky Friday. Well. This year, it'll be 62 years of marriage between the two of us. Wow. So, thank God that we had a nice life. Were you wearing a uniform at the time? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure, I was in uniform. And then, see, so how long from when you met your wife to, to from you? May, from April, but his, I mean, this is off the record. So six months later, then you were, you were married. I wasn't yeah. supposed to be married until after I got out of service. Sure. And she came down and she lived with me. We had a little house in Belleville when I was stationed at Scott Field. So we had a little, we rented a little house down there. So we were there for a while until I was shipped to St. Louis. And from St. Louis, I was overseas. So the, it was an exciting, challenging time for your wife too. She, oh, yeah. she gets married and then she has to go live on an army base or somewhere, and then what's going to happen to her husband where he's going to be shipped? It's, That's right. Yeah. Sure. I, left, I, I had a, a, a Buick convertible at that time. <laughs> I can't forget that. We used to call her Betsy. Betsy the Buick. <laughs> a, a black car, white wall tires, red leather upholstery. Beautiful. $1,400. That was the cost of the car. In fact, when I was gone, somebody offered her $2,000 for the car but she wouldn't sell it. Mm. Oh yeah, we used to bring stuff home. They used to take, once in a while when I was in the service, 
in St. Louis and uh, before we were married, she used to tell me that they're short on rations. And this buddy of mine was the head of the commissary down in, in St. Louis. So every time I was going home on a pass, I'd tell him what I need. And he'd give me pineapple, he'd give me sugar, and he'd give me all this stuff. We piled it in the car, and I drove for eight hours to get home and brought all that food home. And so it's the old story. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And even then, that was the trick, and it, it still worked. Even today, that's what happens. So after the after the war, did you have any, in a sense, you didn't, maybe you had less, was it might have been less difficult to adjust to peacetime or civilian life because you you worked with your dad. There was this, and you already you already had a beautiful education. You didn't have to worry about the GI Bill and anything else. No, there was no such thing as a GI Bill because I mean my tuition I think was 150 a year or a semester. Now it's thousands. At that, that that time, there's no such thing. Yeah. And you got into school and and uh, the only thing to tell you the truth, the only thing I worried about because it was difficult to get in Northwestern because I was Jewish. There was a quote. Is that right? Oh, there was a quote at that time, no question. When you you mentioned um, that, that there may have been some. Um or there was anti-Semitism uh, yes. quota system yes, at Northwestern. Was there any, do you have any experience of that in the service? Because I have interviewed quite a few veterans and a few, a few have been Jewish and they have, every one of them has had um, an, un an unpleasant. The only, the only time I had a problem is when I was ahead, it was in St. Louis. I can't remember it was in St. Louis when I was a chief clerk and I was a master sergeant. And no, it was in Scott Field. And I applied for membership to the Enlistments Club. And the, the president of the Enlistments Club was a staunch Nazi. Oh dear. He was terrible. He used to, everybody used to talk the way he used to train his kids to anything they do on command. And uh, he blackballed me. So I said, okay. I said, you blackballed me? Now it's my turn. Sure enough, but a month later, I got a requisition from the men's club. He was a president for a refrigerator or something like that. They wanted to replace in the, in the PX. And it came to me and I told the colonel, uh-uh. No. He said, why not? And I told him what happened. He said, okay, mark it then NG. We send it back, can't have it. And that's the way I got back to him. But that's what happened. That's the only time I had trouble. Otherwise, my t in the service, everywhere we went, there were four of us who were master sergeants. Three Italian boys and myself. You know what they used to call us? The Four Dagos. <laughs> to me, I was one of them. But I never had any problem. That's the only time I ever had a problem. At one time. After the war, did you keep up with any anybody that you'd met in the service or yeah, BFW to, I, or? Oh yeah, my first sergeant. Until, was it last year? Last Christmas, I had to get a card. He's from Ironwood, Michigan. But last, two years ago was the last time, every year I used to get a car, Christmas card. And I used to send one to him. And this time I sent one to him, but I never got an answer. So I don't know if he passed away or what. But uh, that was the last contact I had with anybody else. You didn't go, did you go to monthly meetings or of any veterans organizations or reunions or not too much? You know, I know something funny. You know what American Legion sends letters to? Not to me, to my wife. They don't even mention my name. But uh, I joined the men's club at the library, but I used to go to it, but 
There was nobody there that I knew. Yeah. And only once in a while I met one fellow, and I used to see him a couple of times. But then I didn't see him anymore, and, and uh, there was nothing there for me. Yeah. So I just stayed away from it. I just don't go. Um, hi, you were telling me an interesting story there that you had kept a diary all during your service years, but then when you went overseas, they said... They couldn't take the diary with me. So I used to... Wait a minute, this should be in the third book. Let me show you. This is the second book. This is the third book. Tickets to the World Series back in 1945. Wow. Right here. World Series tickets. Down in St. Louis. Yeah. Grand Sand Seats. You know what it was? I don't remember who won it in 45. Dollar and a quarter. Yeah. You wouldn't so, get it for a dollar and a quarter these days. You paid $65 now for a bleacher. Yeah. They have other things. I know there's. Oh, here it is. Here it is some of the skins. See? Oh, yeah, you, they, they're, yeah, you can tell they're, they're much thinner. Yeah. That's uh, nice if they sit in. I don't know what this stuff. So, um, oh, you're beautiful. Ray is uh, showing to me an Army Air Force's Certificate of Appreciation for War Service. Um, signed by the Commanding General of the Army Air Forces. I can't make out his signature. That, that's not Arnold or someone, is it? Or No. Yeah, not, okay. not, not too clear, but certainly, uh, certainly official. I wonder if that's half Arnold, I don't know. These are the immunization registers of the shots that were given. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> oh, I remember uh, watching these guys, <laughs> big guys, they would faint. Yeah, the when, when he gets shot. Yeah. Was it the, um, as I'm sitting here, it's um, your decision to, um, to volunteer. Was that, a, was that common among, among other young men 
after the Pearl Harbor that they wanted to respond as patriotic Americans or? No, it wasn't. It wasn't uh, common. It wasn't common at all. I was the only one of my friends that I remember who volunteered. And why did you volunteer? It's hard to answer that question. Looking back, I say to myself, I must have been a jerk. Why should I volunteer to get killed? But at that time, I felt that I owed it to the country that I was born in. It was my way of giving back something that they gave me. And my father looked at me and I remember we were driving on the way to the draft to get a deferment. And he looked at me and says, is that the way you feel? And I says, yeah. He said, turn the car and we're going home. We never got to the draft board. So they came, after they, and that's when they drafted me, when they, so it was a volunteer part on my part. So were they, your parents were relieved that you weren't sent overseas then, into oh, combat? Sure. Oh, sure. And how did you feel about that, if that was just? I was lucky. I was very lucky because twice I was called up. They were taking people from the Air Corps to fill the ranks of the, of the Army because they were short men. And both times, the officers in charge of the physicals, they told me, we'd love to send you, but Without your glasses, you'd be shooting our own men. He said, no, you're not going. And that's why they never sent me. Had you always had uh, worn glasses, or was it from being yeah, a... Never until I got to university. Was it studying and the reading, you think? Uh... I don't know what happened. It could have been, because all I remember is that I can just picture it one day in school. It's this... I was sitting in the class, and the teacher, instructor, I don't know, the professor, whatever it was, at the time we didn't have classes like we do now, where there's 200, 250 people in a small class. And he was lecturing something on, on a board, and uh, he asked questions, and I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, because I couldn't see it. Then I got home, and on the way home, I looked at the various things, and I remember one thing to be in particular, that I know there's a drugstore in the corner, but I'm not sure that that was what I saw. So I decided I'm gonna have my eyes tested, and I found out that they had, how bad they were. And when they put glasses on me, I mean, it was like a whole new world. In fact, when I was in law school, and I was, I didn't want to wear glasses because I thought that it wasn't manly enough. And I used to walk in the lobby, and the mains lounge was at the end of the hall. And you walk in the lobby, and then you turn right to go upstairs to a class. If you go left, you go down to the lounge. And I took toward the lounge that day and somebody there was waving at me. I didn't know who it was. When I got home, I said, there's something wrong. So that's why I had my eyes in again, and I found out how bad it was. I got glasses, and I realized I was seeing things I never saw before. <laughs> it's true, yeah. just the way it was. Yeah. But since then, I've been wearing glasses. So, all of your service it was with the Army Air Force, e even the... No, I was in, this, in the Army, Army itself for... Uh, As the radio operator? They were training me to be a radio operator. But like, like I said, after 12 weeks or so, I don't know how many weeks, 10 or 12 weeks of class, 
they pulled me out because I couldn't pass the eye exam. Even though I passed all the other exams with high marks. It's to hearing and everything, but not for the eyesight. So that's when they, they pulled me out and uh, I just do nothing until I finally found this administrative work. Mm -hmm. I did a job and I will say this, that I earned every, every commission I got because I worked for it. Because I know my goal was to be a master sergeant and I was going to get it. And I finally did get it. So you were, you were as you look back, um, you, were, you, you're, you feel pride in that you did uh, oh, yes, enlist, and you, you have to feel proud that you made Master Sergeant. Well, darn well. No question about that. No question about that. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. certainly... Um, because uh, I got letters of commendation from officers when I was leaving. I, can't, I, really, I don't know where those letters are. But the general and a couple of colonels wrote beautiful letters of commendation for me. Yeah. It didn't do any good because I couldn't pass the entrance exam for OCS at that time. Because of the eye, because of the eyesight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you would have considered so they passed me. The board passed me because it, you wouldn't believe it. I went before the board for the final passage to go to OCS and they asked me one question. And the question was, was I wearing issued shoes? At that time, you had regular, regular shoes, but I went and bought some half shoes like officers wore. And I said to some of the boys in the, in the barracks who were enlisted people, I said, is it all right to wear these things before the board? I said, I don't know. And they said, sure, why not? Every the officers wear one. Why can't you? It's just a half shoe, half the size of a regular boot. And apparently, it didn't go over with the board, but that's the only question they asked me. Was I wearing issued shoes? And I said, no. And they passed me, and I found out later through friends of mine that I had enough grades, but not enough to go to officer school. The grade was high enough, but it just missed because of that. So I never became an officer. So you would have enjoyed that? You would have gone on to? Oh, yeah. If I made up my mind to do it, I would. But I was very happy being a master sergeant. No question. You would never have thought of making a career of the Army. Oh, no. When I was in Europe, not in Europe, the time came for, what do you call it, leaving the service. They came to me and they wanted me to stay in. I said, what for? We want you to help go to Europe and help renegotiate the contracts we let that we don't need anymore for materials and stuff. And I said, uh-uh. I said, four years is enough. I said, I'm going home. And that's what I went home. Instead of being, instead of going to Europe and saying another enlistment, and I just, said that I had enough and I'm going home. And that was it. So, um, as we approach the, uh, the end of the interview, um, do you think your, your World War II service affected your view on life or sure. history or oh, yeah. in, in what way? You look at people differently. Different classes of people that you live with. How they lived. And you begin to understand why some of them are antagonistic and some are not. And some are educated and some weren't. And uh, different, different views, even we talked about religion. We used to argue about things. But would you be a better person if you went to church or if you stayed home and didn't go to church but believed in God? We had terrific arguments about that, but we never had an answer. But it was worthwhile to just just to discuss it. Yeah. 
So I met, I met some nice people, very nice people. You got a better feel for the human race then. Yeah. In fact, I remember how bad it was as far as the black people are concerned, except when they came out with a regulation on swimming classes that men that the whites and blacks at Scott Field would swim together. And oh, we had a lieutenant in charge of our squadron that uh, was from the South, and he was dead against it. And all you had to do was tell him, you don't feel good. Okay, you don't have to go. And he knew why, but uh, that's the way it was. But you learn now, even now, I look at, I look at black people in a certain ways some I, I, I admire, others I don't. But I'm able to distinguish. At that time, there was no distinguishing. It was all one thing, black or white. So it changed over the years. Remember, we used to have, when we had the big factory it was manufacturing gloves, we used to have a black fellow who was a, a chauffeur for my father. Very nice guy. He used to take us everywhere. He was a wonderful fellow. And other times we had people that were very antagonistic. So it was a, a two-way street. Sometimes they could accept it, a, a white man's way, and other times they couldn't. So as you look back on the, the service, would you say the most interesting work that you did was the work in Japan, or not necessarily? I think it was the most interesting because of the background, the legal background. But on the other hand, I did a lot of very interesting things before they even knew about my, and before I went to Japan, I used to work on history, like history of the section. The colonel would say, see what you can find out how our, our section started out, how we learned, how we became one. And I used to go to the library and, of the building. We, we were recorded at that time in a girls' school. They had a library. and. Uh, I used to go through the files there, trying to find different things. You pick up something here and there, the directors appointing us and how they opened up the school here. One of the schools was at the Hilton Hotel in Chicago. One was somewhere on the south side on 55th Street. And then you had uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. You had different schools and that was called the Central Tech Training Command. It was all under our office. And at that time you were working in? St. Louis. In St. Louis. Yeah. Sure. And that's why my woman, my colonel was, was transferred to Texas. He wanted me to go with him. I'm sure. That's what he said. But I talked over to my wife and I said, I don't know. I said, I'm not sure if I want to do that leave here because the people know me, they know who I am, they know what I do, and going down there, even though it would be a pleasure to go with him because he'd asked for me, but I had to do the initiation of the request, and my wife and I decided, no, we would be closer to home, so we said, no, we won't go. So that had been like uh, Fort Sam Houston or Kelly Air Base or San Arlington Antonio? Tech, somewhere in Arlington, Texas. Arlington, Texas. It was, an, it was an airfield down there. That's where he would go. Yeah. So the bulk of your time in the service was spent in this tech? In St. Louis. In St. Louis. Yeah. And your wife was able to live in a, with yeah. you down there in a, in a house that you yeah, rented. We had, we had a little house. But then when you went overseas for the final 
six or seven months, she, went home. she came back to Chicago. Sure. She, she stayed home. with her people then, or yeah. yeah. She stayed home with her, her, her folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the ar the army got more. They got another half a year of service out of you, and they they um, that you didn't necessarily have to uh, provide them with, but no. you have no re you no know, regret regrets though, doing that. No, I never resented the fact that I went, because fortunately, I was never seasick, and we went through some terrible storms in the ocean. And I know the only time I got close to it was one time I was sitting at the table, and the guy next to me got sick at the table. So I didn't like that. And we had, there were times when we were, it was so rough that we couldn't sit at a table we used to sit on the floor with our wall again, our back against the wall, with a tray in your lap, and that's the way you ate. The storms were so heavy. Yeah. Do you remember the ship that you traveled on, or? Uh, yeah, I got names of it. Yeah. Sure. yeah, it's all in the pictures. Yeah. The, uh, did you did you encounter other men in the service who were as well educated as you were? No, nobody with a degree. If I had college boys who went to college. I never met anybody who had a college degree myself. Your, uh, your major in, at uh, Crane and Northwestern, you majored in your degrees in? Uh, Bachelor of Science in Commerce. Commerce. Yeah. Uh, BSC. BSC. And then I got a JD in law school. Yeah. We were the first uh, veteran I've interviewed who was uh, who was a lawyer and had their career already established before the war happened. Usually it's a case of the, the veterans coming home and picking up their college again or finding a career. Yeah, so it's, it's they interesting. Went in earlier, Jack. Yeah. I went in but at that time. I guess that they must have been desperate to start taking older people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But like I say, I was fortunate that I was never transferred to the Army. It remains in the Air Corps. Yeah. But uh, you're a wonderful man, another, uh, you know, shining example of that generation that, um, that stepped up and served their country. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to have interviewed you. So, uh, Thank you. Thank you. so if there's, um, if there's anything else you care to add, but I think we've, we've kind of covered it. I can't think of any, anything else except, oh, the one thing, it was very interesting. It was when I was in in St. Louis. One day the colonel told me, he says, you're going to Salt Lake City on a, a conference. I said, what are you talking about? At that time, I was a, I wasn't a master sergeant, I was a tech sergeant. He says, you represent our headquarters at this conference. I said, who's going to be there? He said, you'll see. So I went with a lieutenant who stayed in a hotel in Salt Lake City. We went to the conference. We walk in there. God, I didn't know what the hell to do. I was the only enlisted man there. The rest were anywhere from lieutenants to generals. Everyone was an officer. And they had a placard on a desk, Sergeant H.H. H. Ray. And me, I was the only enlisted man in the whole place. There was something to do with the training in the various schools. And fortunately, when I came back with the lieutenant, I said to the colonel, I said, my colonel, I said, do I have to write a report on this? He said, no, you don't have to. We're going to send a report out what happened. I said, thank God, because I, I, I didn't know what to write if I ever did, if you asked me for a report. But I felt so funny at first being the only enlisted man in the whole place. Yeah. What a compliment. Well, I say I appreciate it. Yeah. Like I said, when I when I left, they brought in the lieutenant colonel to take my place. Yeah. One last question. When the these training schools that you mentioned in mm -hmm. Chicago and Sioux Falls or Yeah, Chinute down in uh, uh, you know, you know, champagne. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the schools. 
the flame schools. <clears throat> That's where they taught. So you were in, in, engaged with the administration of these training schools for flying. Mm -hmm. For that, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think at this point, um, I'm going to conclude the interview and say thanks a lot, Hi. Thank you very much. Sure.